and uh, something that, uh, for a title, I started to call the freedom fallacy. Um, and I'll give you a little uh, background on how we're going to set up the talk. Really, it's, you know, over the last uh, decade, two types of games have made the most money, driven the most gamer hours. And one is competitive multiplayer, and the other is uh, open world genres. And what we're going to do today, because we had to sort of pick a lane and then drive down it, is that we're going to look at open world, because when we're, it's not that autonomy is only important in open world games. In fact, autonomy is probably the single most important player experience variable across all genres. Uh, is the building OK? <laughs> when I stopped, it stopped. I didn't realize I had that kind of power. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk about open world games um, as, a, as a way of talking about autonomy. But the principles we're going to talk about today are highly applicable, really, re regardless of what you're working on. Uh, just some quick background on, on me and my group and my company. Uh, I'm a behavioral uh, scientist by training. Uh, I focused a lot on motivation and emotion and understanding what were the different contexts and forces that would uh, motivate people, both in high quality ways and, and bad ways. Uh, and I did that work way back, I don't know, too long ago, about 25 years ago is when I finished that. And I immediately pivoted out of that and tried to start applying it to various uh, work contexts and commercial contexts, uh, one of them being video games. And so we started doing that work about 15 years ago. Uh, we then added to the team and immersive games, uh, all the senior leadership are either uh, researchers and people looking at motivation and, and good methodology, or they're people that are coming out of the industry who've had roles from studio head to producer to essentially everything in the food chain. And we really wanted to have both of those things in the organization to drive our culture and make sure that uh, whatever we were doing, we wanted it to be valid and we also wanted it to be practical. And so that's, uh, that's really what we are at our heart. Um, so we do a tremendous amount of work on video games. We do probably 40 or 50 different uh, research projects a year uh, on video games and we've been at this for about 15 years now. Uh, we have a model called the player experience of need satisfaction model that um, I'm going to touch on today, and that's really at the heart of the stuff we're going to talk about. Autonomy is one of the things in that model. Um, I did want to say that that model has a tremendous amount of validation, and I really just wanted to touch on that point because you hear a lot of models uh, when you're coming to GDC and out there. People are always being really creative about thinking about what is it. We're all trying to understand our players. Uh, one of the things about our model is because of, of our pedigree in science and our disposition, we've taken it out and we've made it available for uh, people at other uh, academic institutions and basic scientists to independently test it because we really wanted to know, is it valid, does it work? And there's a lot of literature validating it. Um, and so if people afterwards want a reading list or you know, want some of that material, I'm happy to provide it. Uh, as I said, this model is called the player experience of need satisfaction model. Uh, I'm not going to be going into the components of it in a tremendous amount of detail because I've done that like 12 times <laughs> over the last 10 GDCs. So there's a lot of stuff in the vault uh, on the model. Um, so if people want to get a lot of the background material, but this is really kind of a, I don't know, an, a, a level 200 or 300 course uh, looking specifically at uh, autonomy. I do want to touch on uh, the model uh, briefly though as just a little bit of a uh, cliff notes or a, a primer. Uh, and the model really has at its core, there are lots of different dimensions to it, but at its core it talks about the fact that all of us have basic psychological needs that we have are intrinsically motivated to have satisfied and that move us forward. In other words, we don't need anything external to us in order to motivate ourselves. We have uh, things happening inside and it's our philosophy and the science bears this out that if you can create the circumstances that let me have those needs satisfied, you have reached to the deepest, most powerful form of motivation. And of course, this is very important in the video game space because games are a discretionary activity. People do them because they want to do them and there's lots of competition. And so being able to develop that deep, high quality motivation is really essential. So just quickly, those three needs are the need for autonomy, which we're going to talk about a lot today. That's, in short, our desire to feel like we're writing our own story in life, that we're agentic about what we're doing, um, and that we're endorsing the path that we're on. And as we'll see, I'm going to use a word a lot today called volition. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. The second need is the need for relatedness. 
This is our desire to feel like we belong, that we're connected to others, that I matter to you and you matter to me. And the third is the need for competence, or sometimes we call it mastery. And this is our desire to feel successful and effective in what we're doing, and also to feel like we're growing and elaborating ourselves and we're reaching you know, more and more uh, abilities and experiences. And so these are the three core needs, and I'll be referencing back to them. But today we're really going to focus on the primary need for uh, autonomy. And it's because this is really the foundation, core foundation of what makes modern games work. Now, I bet if I said to everybody here, do you know what autonomy is? Everybody would say that they did know what autonomy was because it's a pretty common word. It's not like a 50 cent word. We hear it all the time. Uh, and developers design using a general sense for autonomy all the time. Right? It's like, okay, I need to give my player this thing called autonomy, so I'm gonna, and then you know, insert your custom recipe right here. The problem is that, uh, or the challenge is, that autonomy is a very complex construct. And misunderstanding it can backfire. And we're gonna, I'm gonna tell actual you know, case examples as we go along here of, of uh, how that's happened. Uh, so what we wanna do, today, not since the doors are closed, is what we want to do is we want to science this up so that we can help everybody understand autonomy. Not just make autonomy, but the, the blue autonomy <laughs> so that you can uh, dominate the market. So it's really understandable, by the way, that autonomy is misunderstood because the dictionary doesn't even get it right from the standpoint of psychology. All right, If you look at definitions of autonomy, you see that lots of words like freedom and independence and freedom and independence. It's just sort of everywhere. And there's a reason that it's like that and why it makes sense because that definition works for, let's say, if you're talking about countries, if you're talking about Australia or you're talking about Bolivia, except this isn't really Bolivia, this is Paraguay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we just have uh, John Oliver fans on our staff that help me put this deck together. Uh, and maybe most apropos for this, the best example for this audience would be, you know, Naboo. But, you know, it's okay if we talk about countries in this way, or if we're more and more you're hearing about uh, autonomous cars and different technologies, and it makes sense that when we're talking about those things, uh, you know, that, you know, independence maybe is the right term. But when we're talking about people, it doesn't apply. It's, it, we're complex, we have consciousness, right? I mean, I don't mean to get too, Cartesian about the whole thing, but you know, it, we're, we have a will and a self, and we, that creates a lot of complexity when we're trying to understand uh, the notion of autonomy. And so what I want to do right up front is pivot us from the idea that autonomy is about freedom or independence to this definition, which is autonomy means that when we act, we do so volitionally. This is the new uh, synonym I want to give for autonomy here. And volition isn't independence or freedom to do whatever you want. Volition is wanting to do the things that you are doing, right? <laughs> God bless the internet. <laughs> so the freedom fallacy, as, as uh, I said in the title, is that autonomy equals freedom. That freedom is a synonym for autonomy. In reality, autonomy equals volition. And I'm gonna give uh, some proof here from everyday life. Right? There are many ways that we freely relinquish freedom in our lives, right? So if we think about autonomy as freedom, that thesis gets disproven in the way that we actually act and go about our lives. So, you know, the, probably the biggest one is, you know, we meet people, we fall in love, and we get married, right? And so, then freedom actually goes down. You can no longer you know, stay up till the middle of the night, or at least I can't, I don't know, but you know, things change, right? But interestingly, our volition goes up, and our, you know, our sense of agency, and that we're writing our personal narrative, and that sense of autonomy, those that things go up, even though we've given up freedom. And then, of course, that story only gets more complex, right? And then, but you know, again, it's... <laughs> This is what somebody with a small child who puts this into every deck. Maybe, maybe in a few years I won't, but. But you know, it's the most wonderful thing, but it's also tremend we're tremendously giving up freedom. So if we think about it as if from a freedom standpoint, we have a problem. But when we think about it from a volitional standpoint, remember, we have multiple basic needs, right? It's not just that we want to be the authors of our lives, we want to actually do something in those lives. 
We want to have needs satisfied for belongingness and connection and growth and all of these different things. And so we, all of those needs drive volitional behavior. And when that happens, we feel agentic. And we feel like we are authoring our lives in a much fuller way than if we were simply behaving independently or behaving with freedom, right? So we create in our own lives structures and all these other things that are rich with need satisfaction. And it's that idea that's the overarching thing I want to talk about today, is that really when we're talking about, uh, we're going to look at it in open world games, but when we're looking in games, it's not creating freedom, let players do whatever they want, give them independence. It's about creating those, that need satisfying uh, structure, content, and systems so that they are volitionally engaged and deeply satisfied. And the, these needs are really the three channels uh, for building that volitional engagement and satisfaction. So that's just a little bit of a kind of run up to how we're going to think about autonomy. But let's start talking a little bit about um, what does this mean for games? Well, the first thing is that there are some sacred cows out there or debates that um, you know, I think have started to change, but certainly were red hot, uh, you know, years ago before, you know, single player games started to become less and less popular. This this whole thing about, well, players really want good story. It's my job is, is I need to give them an experience. And I'm, you know, I'm going to give them some choices, but it's really about giving them an experience. And then there are other people like, no, like here are all these examples where you need to give them freedom, right? Because that's what players want, where they want to create their own stories. And the reality is that that's a false dichotomy. Players, everybody is right in that scenario. The, the thing that unifies it is if you think about it as volition, if you think about it as how do we satisfy players' needs, the reality is, and we're gonna see this in games, that there are components of, uh, of narrative and you know, rich narrative that's written by, by you guys that we're drawing players into through uh, a focus on need satisfaction, and then there's also satisfaction through uh, more open, choiceful mechanics uh, that we think about more traditionally as uh, the purview of open world games. And another thing is that, you know, it's, I, I always hear terms that I, uh, trouble me a little bit, so the whole idea of sandbox games, I know sandbox games are a thing, and I don't have time today to go into when sandbox works, but a lot of times the idea of sandbox uh, it can, they can really turn into motivational sand traps because you sit there and you're like, I'm going to build this experience, I'm going to put all these activities in there, but I don't think about the question of what am I going to do in order to build volition and not just provide all of these things for people to do uh, in the sandbox and then expect them to go out and do that. And so even successful games make this mistake quite frequently. Um, you can see examples in almost every successful game out there. So uh, you can take Red Dead Redemption, and this is, of course, a story where you're John Marston. You're bringing your own brand of justice to the West. You know, this is powerful, you know. And the way you're gonna do that is sitting at a wood table and making sure you don't cut off your own finger. <laughs> or you're Altier. People whisper throughout Italy in hushed tones of your incredible ability to clean up after the pigeons. <laughs> or you're these guys, you know, cyber super hackers. I don't know what the tagline is for these guys, but they look pretty badass, right? It doesn't seem like they're gonna take down the system by playing chess in the park, right? Particularly if they're doing it with an analog speed clock, which seems a little unusual for a hacker thing. Anyway, I'm, I, I don't mean to pick on these things. What I'm trying to bring up is all, all games do this because when you build a big world, you, you know, on the checklist is I have to put things into that world for people to do. What are people going to do in this world? And that's the right idea. But the issue is you need to ask the question, do these things build volition? Are they helping the player to create their own agentic player narrative where they feel need satisfaction? in those things. And if those activities are not, are, are just things out there for someone to do, but are decoupled from any uh, need satisfaction point, then they're not going to be activities that the player engages in. And so one thing that uh, I always recommend when we're talking to developers is when you're thinking about these systems, when you're thinking about content, when you're thinking about all these necessary ways to layer in this activity into a game, to include this on your checklist. You know, how are you building volition in engaging in the activity. 
One thing that's really promising, though, about this idea uh, and, and the pivoting from freedom to volition is we no longer have to be afraid of structure and kind of directing players to do things. It's okay to direct players to do things. As a matter of fact, in all the research that we've done, both in games and out of games, structure is better than providing open and free environments in satisfying people's needs for autonomy. And this relates right back to the point I made with the example of people getting married and doing all these things, is that when you provide structure, you're essentially communicating to them, here are pathways, here are ways in which you can have your needs satisfied. You can engage in these activities, you can engage in them. By the way, the structure of this activity is, you know, you can do a bigger sandcastle if you are doing it with another player. So there's opportunities to, you know, satisfy relatedness, there's opportunities. It's creating those structures that act and that telegraph or communicate need satisfaction that actually build that volitional engagement and not just giving them a lot of freedom to do whatever they want to do. Even if the game is enormous and it's filled with tons of activities, it, it doesn't matter if the player doesn't see meaning in the options that are in front of them, right? So uh, in Far Cry 3, I'm just picking one at random. I'm trying to you know, pick from a variety of different games. There's uh, the opportunity to go you know, kill water buffaloes you know, so that you can get crafting materials. And of course, when you first go to do this, this has a meaning. It has meaning in building volition because there are needs being satisfied. You know, you have the ability to craft materials and make different things, which gives you meaningful choice, which makes you more agentic, which satisfies autonomy. You also are crafting things that help to increase your ability and power, which is helping growth and efficacy. So you have autonomy and confidence. I don't think there's any relatedness needs in shooting the water buffalo. I don't really know. Uh, so, so that's the thing is in this formula, it doesn't mean you've got to hit every need every single time, but you can see that you can, the way I just did, you can look at any activity and try to tear it down about what is going to be the experience in terms of need satisfaction that builds volition. And the problem here is that once you get the thing that'll, that, that, and so it's no longer relevant, you still have all these water buffaloes on the map, but essentially you've, you've lost any support for volitional engagement in that activity. And what happens then is you still got a map with a lot of water buffaloes on it, but now all these things that are so-called opportunities for action or things that you want to do, these are really just points of noise. They aren't really opportunities. So the key is not just to offer more things and fill up the world with things to do. It's certainly more is better, but it's most important that however much you have, you need to have a dense network of things that matter to people because that's what drives volitional engagement. Now, just as a little sidebar, you hear this all the time, you want meaningful activities, you need things that matter, you need things that people value. We're always, I mean, nobody describes their game as it's a game full of experiences, they say it's a, it's a game full of great experiences, it's a game full of meaningful experiences. But when you look at those words, you know, again, as a, as a behavioral psychologist, I'm like, okay, well, how are we gonna define what those words mean? There are many different ways you could do that, but really when I'm talking about meaningful, work, you know, meaningful experiences, valued experiences, it really does all come back to, are these needs being satisfied? And I say that because we've just collected a lot of data to see that that works really strongly. Other things may work, but we know this works really well. So I, I wanna next take a little bit of time and go through some of the ways that uh, Modern games and leading games, open world games right now, are building volition and deeply satisfying autonomy because even though the ingredients may be the same, autonomy, competence, relatedness, uh, the formulas can change. There's a lot of opportunity to be you know, very creative in how these things get satisfied. So the first is uh, you know, what we call the amusement park structure. And this is really invented and forever dominated by the game that essentially created the open world genre, you could argue, which is uh, Grand Theft Auto. And the amusement park structure is, you know, operates on a, a pretty simple premise, which is build a dense world of satisfying rides, right? So when you are engaged in the narratives in Grand Theft Auto, you're not, it's not really your narrative. You know, you're switching characters, you're engaging in different stories, but you're getting exposed to this world and these opportunities of things that have meaningful value in that when you engage in them, they're 
you know, you're conquering challenges, you're, um, you, these, these are not, these are good rides, right? And because there's enough of a spectrum of these good rides, it's actually very need satisfying and you feel a sense of meaningful choice. So this is all building volition. So GTA doesn't win because it's really big and there's lots of things to do. And I mean, how, I, we, whenever any open world game starts to come out, people start, one of the metrics that people start talking about is how big it is. Well, we discovered you can take the ver last version of our game and fit it into a map that's 10 times as big. And everybody gets very excited about that. And the reason people get excited about that is one of the ways that players assume that they're gonna have all kinds of autonomy is it's big, because they give you the benefit of the doubt that no matter how big it is, it's gonna be awesome. So, so that's kind of, I guess, a good thing, but it also creates a very high bar to clear. So you get a lot of freedom, but you also have all of these really uh, enjoyable and meaningful activities in GTA. But what GTA lacks are rich opportunities for growth. You know, it doesn't have RPG mechanics, or you know, again, I'm talking about early, you know, early GTA. I know there's we have multiplayer and all these other things now. I'm just trying to lay out um, a little bit of the, uh, of the, the fundamental DNA of the game. And what it lacks really are rich opportunities for growth and also for creating a player's story. Because the whole idea of a player narrative, the player narrative is really critical because that's how players integrate and amplify volition, right? We, we're, always, we're engaged in a, in a personal narrative all the time. And when we go into games, that narrative just continues. So these narratives will ideally reflect the player's self, interests, and values. And Games can build volition by giving players the appropriate tools in order to uh, build those narratives. And so what we see in GTA is we don't see a lot of rich building blocks for that, but amusement park structures are, are relatively thin, but they do give uh, kind of words and verbs. I'm, a, I'm gonna bowl, I'm a triathlete, I'm gonna be in a drag race. And so the player then has to assemble, you know, essentially a narrative about, well, I'm a really, I'm like the most awesome drag racer, you know, in GTA, or, you know, they're assembling a narrative. But, you know, it's really, it's relatively thin. And so when we then start to look at some other examples of how needs get satisfied in open worlds, we start to see uh, how people turn the knobs on some of these things in order to increase volitional engagement. So the next thing I want to turn to is an approach called the dense RPG approach. And a good representative for this is Skyrim. Um, people have played the hell out of Skyrim for a lot of hours over a very long period of time. It has a very high level of sustained engagement and volitional engagement. And Skyrim really wins because they have incredibly rich RPG systems that deepen uh, volition by empowering growth and providing richer narrative threads. They're, they're giving much longer narrative threads than you would in an amusement park structure, right? So there's just, it's a staggering amount of things that you can do uh, when you're in the game. And this results in uh, more elements of need satisfaction in order to build uh, volition. You've got more meaningful choice, but you also now have the ability to build agentic narratives because you've got all these narrative threads that you can begin to, to stitch together to build your narrative. These are not things that are really present in the amusement park structure. That builds volition. The other thing is that you're not just looking at uh, issues of overcoming challenges and feeling that moment-to-moment -moment satisfaction of competence. You're also engaging in growth through the RPG mechanics. And that is one of the most powerful ways to build volition if you create that meaningful sense of growth in games. So Skyrim, again, using the same ingredients, but they're essentially um, uh, putting them in in different degrees and creating different systems in order to build volitional engagement. Uh, the main volitional hook, of course, is this uh, uh, growth, and it's integrated with a massive quest system, but I would say that one of the things that's great about it is that when you engage in quests and you do things, it has an impact on you. So your personal narrative to be a vampire, you can actually change who you are and become a vampire. So there's this impact of systems uh, as you make your choices that truly make the character that you're building your own, which is really, uh, which, which is really powerful volitionally. You've got in Skyrim something you don't have in GTA, which is you get full sentences. I'm the head of the Witcher's College, I'm, you know, I'm the leader of the Thieves' Guild, I suck blood of sleeping villagers. 
I now have these larger chunks with which to build my player narrative. And so all of these things have meaningful impact uh, on the actual character themselves. But there's one thing that is missing from this, which is that in the end, nothing really matters, no matter what you decide to do. You could be a werewolf, vampire, cat, person who, I don't know, to fill in sentences here. Whatever you decide to do, you know, there's, you don't have this major, you know, this main storyline that you're, you know, shifting or adapting. There's, there's, no, there's no epic impact on the world. Really, the impact is just building a narrative yourself. So that's very, it's a very powerful game, but I want to turn now to another formula that's out there in order to build autonomy and build volitional engagement. And that's the idea of narrative impact. So the representative game we're going to pull here is Mass Effect. So Mass Effect, the main volitional hook, the main thing that makes me feel agentic and engaged in what I'm doing and need satisfied in what I'm doing is not just I can change the world, I can change the universe. And so they're spreading out across multiple needs, various satisfactions. So you're getting meaningful choice. You probably can't notice it. It's slightly less meaningful choice, but you're, instead of making meaningful choices amongst little tributaries and rivers of things that are going on, that as you would in Skyrim, you're making choices between these sort of deep, you know, these deep rivers that go very, and, and they're all like coming towards the ocean and you have a sense of epic scale. And this is rendered in the content and in the cinematics and in all of these things, right? So you feel this deep sense of narrative purpose. And because you're directing these great narratives you also have relatedness, right? Um, everybody that I know has a Mass Effect story about like, oh, they felt, you know, they felt this moment you know, of connection. Um, mine really was involving Tally and I accidentally killed her and then I had to go back and reload my save game and it was very traumatic because I didn't know if I saved in time, but it's okay, she's okay, she's okay. <laughs> and then there's also some growth and some overcoming of challenge in the game, but you know, that's not really the, the tentpole of the Mass Effect experience. So Mass Effect, if, if uh, Grand Theft Auto gives words and if Skyrim gives sentences, Mass Effect is giving whole paragraphs for players to kind of assemble and put together, right? And so you're able to put together, you know, a richer story more quickly that can build a stronger um, volitional engagement with the game. And so it's all powerful stuff when, when it works. Right? When it works and you're telling the story you want to be telling and then you get to see it jump to life on the screen, it's very powerful. The problem for you guys as developers is if you take this kind of approach, you have you know, what we call kind of a mind reading dilemma, which is that you've got to figure out not just like this paragraph and paragraph two and paragraph seven, but paragraph you know, 48. And you've got to figure all that stuff out and that's, and that's really hard to do because Players are going to have different opinions, and you can't fully realize every possible outcome. And so your risk of breaking volition is really high, right? A, a player could be putting together this really great narrative and then, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then try to get to a point that they want to get to, and if you don't offer it, it's not just that they have a bad moment. It's that it really you know, blows apart the whole narrative for them. Now, it's the same... Uh, thing that's going on when we look at what happened when Mass Effect had the big ending debacle, right? Because if Mass Effect is sort of standing on giving people meaningful choice to create their epic story about how they save the universe, having everything end the same way is not just like, oh, that, oh I'm really mad at you for doing that. It's you. Betrayer, hundreds of, I mean, this is deep because we're talking about basic psychological needs. So what you have happening is by the end of the game, the betrayal happens because they essentially kick out meaningful choice because the ending is the same. And then with meaningful choice without that foundation, then there is no you know, narrative purpose that falls away. And then if nothing I did really matters, then I didn't really save Tally. You know, she, she, she doesn't love me. I've come to accept it. You know, that falls away. 
And then with all that gone, you, you no longer have any structure supporting volition. And worse yet, you've essentially violated this contract with the player because you've, you've messed with uh, their basic psychological need for autonomy. And this is the thing about autonomy. Autonomy is, is powerful stuff. It's like the fentanyl of, I don't know if that's the best example, but you know, it's stuff that, it's, it's super powerful, but it can, you know, you've got to handle it really carefully. So bottom line is you don't want to mess with autonomy. All right, let's talk about one more. And then I want to uh, turn a little bit and talk about, uh, based on everything that we've said about some of these dynamics and systems, what could come next. So uh, the next, last one I want to talk about is Witcher, which we kind of see as a hybrid. It's sort of cool when, when Witcher came out and we had the chance to um, play that game and look at that game. Uh, because Witcher really takes inspiration from Mass Effect uh, and Skyrim structures. So you see um, a rich main narrative that's uh, like Mass Effect, it's fully realized. Um, and there's a beautiful deep story there. But you also see an incredibly deep um, system of uh, quests and stories uh, and activities that can be undertaken um, uh, in the way that Skyrim provides them. And in some ways, uh, that provides nice coverage, and that provides nice dense coverage uh, for need satisfaction, whether you're engaged in the big epic story or you just want to have um, a meaningful couple hours of play to help yourself progress. Lots of deep uh, volition building, again, meaningful choice uh, over narrative. Um, you've got a lot of those same kind of relational uh, dynamics. And um, you've got a little bit of growth. Growth is not kind of the, you know, there are RPG systems in there, not as dense or as rich as Skyrim's. Um, but you are uh, conquering challenges and you're really kind of hitting on all these cylinders. So there's very strong volitional engagement. One thing that Wizard did very, uh, uh, it was very interesting to me was they traded in fidelity in order to better deliver on the promise of impactful choices. And so they couldn't fully render all the endings they want to render. So they're like, well, let's not render them. Let's just tell them comic book style. And let's make the bet that the player just wants to see the story. They want to finish the story and they want to see the story that they were writing. And I think that was the right choice. You know, would it be great if they could have fully re rendered everything? Sure, that would have been great. But the choice here to focus on a dynamic that uh, is going towards need satisfaction versus just going towards fidelity, I think is, is always the right decision. Uh, also, even in their side quests, their side quests were not just take these 10 flowers to Bob in, in the town over. Their side quests were uh, pretty fully realized three-act structures. You know, Geralt gets a mystery handed to him that he must solve, and he goes and figures, it, you know, it's put in front of him and he has to make a decision, and then he sees an impact. And so there's this sort of full narrative that lets people, you know, again, have their paragraphs handed to them about what they're doing, but if they misstep, it doesn't, these things are decoupled from the main narrative, so it doesn't break their volitional engagement in the game itself. So uh, having kind of these nested, um, you know, deep stories, uh, deep side stories within the larger main narrative worked well. So one of the reasons that I, I talk about um, multiple games and multiple strategies is to point out that there is no one right way to do this. We can certainly look at it, and as researchers we do, we look at, well, this seems to have a lot of value, and this, and we, you, this has some value, and this is more value. But there's lots of different ways that you can tackle these issues. Um, all of which are focused on uh, need satisfaction in the service of building volition and people leaning forward into the experience, but there are lots of ways to satisfy those needs, right? Um, I did want to point out, though, that in all the things I just talked about, all the reasons that these games are winning really aren't about freedom. They're about that meaningful choice, growth, mastery, and that basic need satisfaction. So let's now turn to the challenge here, which is, only a handful of companies on the planet can really make these games, right? That can make Volition at scale. And even for them, it's hard. And what's the timeline for, you know, between these games being released? I mean, this is, this is epic. So that creates an opportunity. Like, if we could find ways to deliver dense Volition at scale, 
then open world is going to become a much richer space for both developers and players, right? So our little scientist guy, which is really you guys, you know, like, okay, how could we do that? And there are lots of different directions I could go in now about things out there and the ways people are trying to think about that, but I just want to, I want to do this one because it's so, it's the main one, I think, and it's really salient, which is procedural systems, the magic of procedural generation, right? Ah, we can press a button and our game springs to life. So I say the agony and the ecstasy because there's no doubt that people want that to be true, <laughs> right? We want that to be true. We just want that game. And that's because of our need for autonomy, right? And, you know, there's a couple narratives here. I'll just pick the most recent one, which is uh, No Man's Sky. And I don't want to pile on and complain about No Man's Sky. I actually, I played the hell out of No Man's Sky. I think No Man's Sky is a really important game. And there's tons I love about No Man's Sky. But, you know, No Man's Sky had some issues. <laughs> and it had a lot of issues with players. And it has to do with all the experiential things we're talking about. And it has to do with the fact that they fell into the freedom fallacy trap. If you want to see more evidence that autonomy is the single biggest thing that your players are thinking about, think about the fact that when the game got delayed, Sean Murray got death threats just because it got delayed. This also happened, I think, I don't remember, but I think during some of the Mass Effect stuff, there was also a story about some death threats for people. Like, like death threats about a game. And I was thinking, wow, the only two games I know that of are big space games. I wonder if there's something about the promise of autonomy there that's really pissing people off, right? Then when the game launched, of course, we have all the stuff that people have heard about, which is the nasty backlash against it, because why? Why was there a nasty backlash? Because people, there's nothing to do. What am I doing? There, was, there wasn't any dense volitional content in there for people to consume and be satisfied by. People burned through the, the very thin layer that was there on the first two planets, and they were out, if that. And then there came the existential navel-gazing about maybe it was all of our mistake. Like, I, seen, I saw multiple articles, but I thought it was really funny. And really, they were fundamentally making a, a, a point about autonomy. It's like, why is it that we expect so much? Is it, is it that we, you know, you know, fill in the story here. And you know, I, I, I find all this fascinating because it really makes perfect sense to me because of how we're all fanboys of autonomy. That's what we want. And so we need this space game. Space is a perfect example for it. It doesn't mean that it has to be a space game. We need a game that fulfills the promise that we think about when we think about No Man's Sky. But of course, we've all been through this before. We went through this 10 years ago with Spore, right? And again, Spore did some amazing things, but Spore was a disappointment. And it was a disappointment because of autonomy. Everybody wanted to get to the space stage and spend the rest of their lives exploring all this awesome content. And uh, you know, that didn't happen because there wasn't a focus on volitional engagement. And of course, you know, there are people in the wings waiting to come in. So there's some other people on deck to either make us all super, super happy or need to go into hiding. I don't know. But I'm rooting for, I'm rooting for it. I'm rooting for this genre. Um, I think I understand why players want it. Players, you know, project this. To come back to the point I was making earlier, they project this deep autonomy satisfaction within this universe. But it's because they don't know what the game is yet. So all they have to go on, the only information they have to go on, is when you tell them about size. And they project autonomy into size. And don't fall into that trap. Because they don't really want size. They want, they want size, but they want to be, they want volitional engagement. And so we figured out how to make all these planets with procedural content. And I just want to say that if we're going to solve this issue, whether it's in space or some other type of game, we're not going to solve it by procedurally generating content and then backfilling it with handcrafted uh, you know, material and activities. You know, it'd be like trying to fill up the ocean with a shovel. It's just, it's not going to happen. So I want to propose that you guys all go out and maybe tackle, if you're not already, you tackle a, a challenge, which is the idea of building procedural volition. And 
what I mean specifically here is that you create systems to automatically generate content whose focus is the player experience of those basic need satisfactions. And that may sound like a moonshot of an idea, but if you think about it, look, we, we already know, we've distilled down what the essence is of that all important autonomy satisfaction, which is volition. We know what the granular experiences of need satisfaction are that accrue to that. And we can look at current games and we can see the types of things that they're doing in order to satisfy uh, volition. So we have a lot of interesting pieces on the board, right? So now what we have to do is we just have to figure out how, to, how do we get that to scale, right? So, you know, shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> Obviously, super complicated because now we have to deal with uh, we have to deal with psychology in the mix, um, and we have a whole other set of variables. But you know, I think that I think I would love that game. I bet most people in here would love those games. I think it would be transformative to the creation of games, and I know that players want it because players already feel like they've been promised it like 40 times. So they're you know they're a little bit on edge and suspicious at the same time. Um, there are some glimpses I see out there, I'm just going to touch on one of them, of some cool ideas that don't really qualify as procedural generation, but, but uh, do some interesting magic tricks that show you can generate a lot of the experience of depth and volition, even with very limited resources by, by being smart about what you're doing. So, you know, Shadow of Mordor um, has the Nemesis system. And it has sparks of this kind of idea of being really efficient to generate an expectation and, and, and deep experiences where, you know, the, it procedurally generated, you know, a, a nemesis for the player. And it did that by, you know, when you have interactions with this orc, this, you know, they have massive impact, not just on, you know, the orc itself, if you, you know, shoot an arrow through its eye or whatever you do to it, that, you know, its eye is blocked off, but also, you know, that orc is pissed, or if that orc kills you, by the way, whether you win or lose, you know, things happen, right? The orc kills you, suddenly the orc becomes more powerful. Now there's this, you're knitted together in this relationship, and also you've learned a schema for the game that isn't exactly accurate. And the schema is, wow, if, no, these orcs, they really take everything personally. This is like, they're all out there, like, who knows what could happen? Now, you know, the players can pattern fit very quickly that there wasn't that much depth, but just the amount of depth that was there allowed for a really compelling personal narrative where people felt like, this is my story. That was my one-eyed orc that I you know, shot the arrow through, right? And so you see all of these uh, stories on the internet of uh, players who have these interactions and then you know, they get online and they start talking about, oh yeah, I gotta go kill this guy. You know, this is just, I, I'm not gonna read all this, but uh, there's many, many examples of it. Just to call one thing out, um, the nemesis system let me craft my own story and relationships. In the end, the fighting was the end of the game for me. Me and my bitter rival and nemesis were friends. So if I were to put up, I don't have it here, but the need satisfaction chart for, uh, for Mordor, you know, there's this, amazing thing, which is that this procedural, not procedural system, but this system that laid on top, this nemesis system, uh, created this deep relationship satisfaction, relatedness satisfaction with an enemy, which is really fascinating. So there's really innovative things we can do to take a little and turn it into a lot experientially. Um, I just want to close by talking about um, a couple of things that I think might be worth considering, and I'm saying this fully aware that I'm neither a video game designer nor am I an engineer. So feel free to chuckle or whatever you want to do. But I am somebody that works with data and numbers a lot. And I am somebody that works with formula and, and also trying to take people, and this is going to sound awful, but take people and turn what they're experiencing into things that can be measured and that we can put a number to and that that number is meaningful for something. And I just want to say that that's the piece that um, uh, behavioral psychologists carry around a lot, which is you, you can measure things like love and all these big ideas. Um, you can actually find ways to operationalize and measure them. And since that's true, I think what we need to do is we need to put more player verbs, player variables into our equations for uh, procedural generation. And so instead of just procedurally generating content and then trying to manually wrap systems over the content, 
why can't we be uh, creating systems where as players make choices and they, and they act, that the game world is procedurally altered and it scales. It's not just a decision point that puts you down a bunch of you know, pre-render content, A, pre-render content, B, um, but it's procedurally generated. The second thing is to focus on meaningful impact. Impact is key. And we've seen that in all the things that we've talked about. So we, we, should, we could focus on dynamically changing content, um, goal structures, activity structures, in response to what the players are doing, right? And do that procedurally. You're like, well, what the hell does that mean? What does that look like? I don't know, right? That's, you know, we're here to innovate and design. So these are just some, some thoughts I had about this. And the last thing I want to mention is this idea of latent variables. And for the non-math people, latent variables are just uh, variables that get computed from other variables. So you're tracking all this telemetry and the things that people are doing in the game. One of the great things that is now happening in behavioral science is that you can compute uh, weighting variables and latent variable profiles for people that essentially uh, let people be their own baseline for various things. And you essentially are getting pictures of who that person is. I think these variables could be used as weighting variables in the procedural generation equation so that you could surface for players uh, in a much more powerful way the, uh, the types of experiences and content that are actually aligned with uh, what it is that they have an affinity for. And we could do that much more than we are simply by tracking behavioral telemetry the way that we are now. So anyway, there's, you know, we could talk about you know, ideas for this all day, but I really think that, I, would, I think that if we're gonna actually create the game that we all hoped No Man's Sky would be, or Spore was, or maybe what, what all the next things are, I think that um, we're not gonna crack that unless we can begin to think about engineering uh, deep volitional player experiences through need satisfaction. I think that, why not? I think it could be done. I think it's going to be hard, but everything worthwhile is hard, right? So I think that's it. Just remember whatever comes next. Autonomy equals volition, not freedom. Thanks. All right, so if people have questions, they can come down to the mics. All right, yeah. Hey, how's it going? Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you had spent much time thinking about, um, uh, with regards to belongingness and relatedness, um, the role that other players can play, mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, how one would measure that effect once mm -hmm. you realize that there are other players that are creating this sense of belongingness. So one thing I didn't talk about at all today, which was just very deliberate, is other players. Other players is uh, a massive interpersonal uh, variable and mechanism for need satisfaction. Um, it's, you know, when you look at competitive multiplayer games, the reason that the competitive multiplayer games are so big, and I didn't talk about them, but I referenced them in the beginning, you know, a lot of this has to do with uh, that kind of relatedness uh, satisfaction that's going on. Um, I think that when I think about relatedness uh, in this context, I, I just go back and just like any other system, I would say, uh, what are the uh, experiences or social systems uh, that you want to set up in the game for you know, multiplayer interactions? And how do those uh, systems uh, facilitate belongingness, facilitate uh, I matter to you and you matter to me? You know, the classic example from uh, you know, uh, World of Warcraft or the tank healer structure is that was a mechanic that fostered uh, people feeling like they mattered to one another, because they did. So you know, that's why that takes hold on a relatedness level. So the question is, how can those systems be built? But I, I think it's massively important. Um, and if we were doing a talk on relatedness, <laughs> um, I would have gone into all those things. But what I will say, and I'm glad you asked the question, is that relatedness, and you saw it in the marriage and having a baby example, is a massive driver of volitional engagement. So, I don't, so does that get at your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. We can, we can talk more. About okay, that's great. All right, who was next? Who's next? Walker, can you wait? Okay. Sorry, Walker. Yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about procedural volition. Uh, there is a genre uh, that actually do something that you mentioned, that forex strategies like Civilization or Stellaris 
Mm -hmm. uh, talking about space, by the way. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, how do you think, uh, can we uh, distill somehow the principles like for, for, that, that are work in these Forex games and apply it to open world? Yeah, I, I, so I think, sure, I think that's as good idea as any. I mean, I, I think that those games have a lot of very deeply nested systems that all operate and they create a, they create a dynamic uh, arc to a game that can last, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 hours. Um, I think what we're talking about here, though, is taking things to a much greater scale. Um, in other words, when you play those games, you do get a narrative arc, but you tend to you tend to play the same story over and over again. This is the story of you conquering the world, or the story of you conquering the universe, and then you just kind of go back again. Um, it doesn't create this kind of persistent um, uh, persistent universe that I think is a different thing than things like those uh, strategy games are. But to your point, I think that some of the ideas in there about how they're combining dynamic systems in order to create a ever-changing, you know, landscape moment to moment that lets the player in one game say, I'm pissed off at Gandhi for nuking me, and in another game being mad at, you know, Montezuma, and, you know, I, you know, I think there's something worth mining there, sure. Uh, welcome. So it might just be a uh, terminology, but in your in your graphic about uh, autonomy, uh, competence, and relatedness, holding up volition, mm -hmm. like volition, you have also pointed out is is the same as autonomy. So, what the hell? Right, the hell, right. So you're asking a really nuanced semantic question. So uh, autonomy is. Uh, uh, autonomy is the feeling of agency. It's the feeling of that I am creating my story, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what autonomy is. Volition is if you want to be doing something, then that aligns with that sense of agency, right? And so um, when I put the autonomy as a support, there are other things that also create that sense of wanting and other things. There's the creation of meaningful choices and, and those sorts of things. The other thing I would say is that if you want to get really deep into self-determination theory, it's often the case that you talk about autonomous functioning as a roll-up of all the need satisfiers. Um, because that's, if you had to pick one overarching principle of self-determination theory, it's that you're beha behaving in a way that feels like you fully endorse the path that you're on, and these things all become inputs to that. Okay. Hi. Um, I was one of the designers on Spore, and we mm -hmm. had, um, like, after the game shipped, a lot of hardcore game players really hated it, and we were down on it, like you mentioned. Um, but we also found that a lot of younger players just loved it, like, to the point of people like, where's Spore 2? Like, I love that game. I played it all the time. And I was wondering yeah. if you did much research about age and how it relates to autonomy. Like, why yes. would kids be more autonomous or willing to play in these systems than adults might be? So there's a lot of possible answers to that. Um, one thing is there's context in Spore, and so the you know this, the creature editor was one of the most amazing things that Games has produced, and you know it had a context that um, kids could really relate to. I mean, it looked like you know taking a giant the Play-Doh machine and bringing and putting something together in infinite ways and bringing something to life, and they can map that schema really easily. So there's there's some of that sort of schema mapping and affinity for um, that that's going on. I think that also it's a, it was a context that smaller game of doing that, creating creatures. Like what I'd be interested. I guess my question is, did kids want to go to space, or did kids want to play around? Like, did you ever look at the telemetry and the behavioral data? Because that would give you some clues. Um, yeah, not directly. Although we did have a lot of like parents telling us that their kids couldn't play sport anymore. Like they had to take it away from them because they played it too much. Yeah. And we've seen like drawings from kids that show the whole arc from cell all the way up to space uh, yeah. that they would draw by hand uh, Yeah, they weren't playing the game. So yeah, I mean, my bet is, I don't, we, don't, we don't know because we don't have data, that it's that they're kind of playing at that level. I mean, I, think, I bet if you just looked at how many kids play the creature creator, mothers might complain about that same thing because it was such a, such a compelling piece. Yeah, I, and I, I think the more general question I have is just the age and autonomy, like independent of spore. Right. So the thing about the needs are that they are, you know, one of the quick examples I use is that it's the same as you've got, I'm talking about psychological needs, you also have physical needs. 
And so you have a physical need for hunger and thirst. And think about them in the same way as that. So, um, you know, it, kids have them, adults have them, old people have them, young people have them. It's like, you know, kids don't have less hunger than adults do or less of a need for food than adults do. These are universal things at every age and, and across, you know, really globally. And when I say that, we've measured kids, we've measured across the world, there have been thousands of studies in a lot of domains outside of games that validate the needs. The question is just how, what are the channels by which those needs get satisfied? And so the one thing I will say is that for adults, there are certain things where we have autonomy that um, uh, they don't feel they don't, we don't feel like we're flexing a lot of muscles for growth and experimentation, like picking out our own clothes, for example. You know, that's not, that's not something that's very need satisfying. We've kind of got that down. We've pattern fit the whole picking out our clothes thing. But for kids, you'll see in games that they'll have affinity to, I want to wear the goofy hat and I want to do this thing and I want to experiment because they don't have disposable income to go buy clothes. So the needs are the same, but the channels by which they get satisfied can differ as a function of age, preference, taste, those sorts of things. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, so a lot of what you talked about, I think you touched on this a bit, but it sounds like a lot of creating volition comes from aligning narrative and player choice. So theoretically, perfectly aligned narrative with absolutely no dissonance between player choice and narrative would have very strong volition, is that right? It would have, um, well, I think you're describing like a movie. Yeah, I so guess. I, so, I would, so what I would say is that movies are awesome. <laughs> you know, in other words, like people get very involved in these, in these experiences, and yes, they can be very volitionally engaging. Yeah. But, you know, are they, but they aren't really the, they aren't as engaging as games that give them more opportunity for all the other things that you saw reflected in the model. So things like the ability to grow and conquer challenges and you know, uh, you know, have relationships and those things. Uh, those things are not as deeply satisfied in just a simple, perfectly aligned linear thing. And they certainly don't provide as much value as something that can provide 200, 300, 400 hours. I guess if you could tell a 400 hour story, uh, but I've never seen that done. Right. Yeah. So, so anyway, it's it's people are volitionally engaged, but th they know when they're not writing the story, and systems to let them write the story in our research are more powerful than that. Okay. I, yeah. I guess I'm kind of asking um, more around the hypothetical, which is probably not possible, but the idea of if the narrative uh, drives for the player were perfectly aligned with what the player wanted to do. Yep. The Act or the lack of breadth of choice could almost be hidden. Um, so, in a situation like that, like a narrative. I'm sorry, I missed that. Involves you what? The, la the breadth of choice involves you. Oh, sorry, the breadth of choice would just become hidden so, okay, somewhat. Right. So, if my, what I want to do as a player is always what the game allows me to do, uh, theoretically, there should be no difference between a fully like procedurally generated game where I actually have every choice because I'm always doing the thing I want to do. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you've uh, thought about that at all, like in terms of... Well, that's, if you're going to run into the mind reading problem there big time. <laughs> I mean, that's the issue. Yeah. It's like, so, if, so in, a, in a universe, why not? I mean, I yeah. was doing it. Let's do it with you. In a universe where you could create a game where um, every turn that the yeah. player made was, they thought there were ultimate turns, but it was only that turn and it just kind of followed them perfectly and so you could deeply realize it and crush it. That would be awesome. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's. I think practical. I'll just try to, to rephrase the question. Yeah. Uh, is it a game like say an Uncharted game or a Last of Us, uh, yeah. do you think those actually have potential for the same levels of volition as a more open world game or are they just inherently better at dealing with other needs or satisfying other needs? I think that when people find the, in those games, when people find the narrative engaging and they feel like they, the needs are being satisfied for their sense of you know, competence or connection to NPCs or whatever those things are, that they are volitionally engaged in those experiences, I think they're simply at a competitive disadvantage to other games that are let, giving them all these tools to more fully realize a personal narrative. So, I, I mean, you know, so that's a little bit different than saying this one's worse at volition than this one is. Because I think if you took in the moment, is the person 
volitionally into this. I think that there are certainly going to be moments when the games align, as you point out, where people are going to have volitional engagement. I think it's, it's looking at it this other way that I would say that you know, this is a main reason why that genre has largely died out. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, real quickly, you yeah. talked about um, your examples. You talked about Skyrim uh, and games like The Witcher. One of the things that's so different about those games is Skyrim kind of gives you the avatar suit um, and lets you sort of make that character anyone you want it to be and customizes race, gender, all that stuff. Yeah. Did you guys ever collect any data or have any findings or try to isolate what the, the engagement rate versus, you know, players that get to choose exactly who they want to be versus somebody who steps into a Shepherd or Geralt? Yeah, so I have, we haven't looked at that recently, but I've looked at that, you know, in the past. And from a, from a volitional standpoint, it, there's not a major, there's not a massive impact of those things, right? Because the reality is that regardless of who I skin myself as in that game, whether I get to pick the skin or whether you make me shepherd or somebody, that what the research does show and that we know we've answered pretty definitively is that there used to be a debate of do people get into games so that they can, you know, <coughs> do crazy things and pretend they're a plate of, you know, sentient spaghetti and whatever. And games allow you to be anybody. That's not what players do. Because they want to feel volitional engagement, have needs satisfied, they've, they've optimized how to do that by actually being who they are and wanting the game to let them be who they are, right? And so they're going to tell a player narrative whether they're you know, uh, sh whether they have to play Shepard and they don't like the color of his, you know, <clears throat> shoes isn't really going to matter. They're going to, you know, essentially uh, be looking at the, the core mechanics of the game and narrative and everything in order to tell their story. So. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, how much? Oh, we're done? All right. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm giving this sign. That sounds serious. So thank you very much, everybody.